morning, everyone. Good morning. So two times ago, uh, you know, we're on a rotation speakers here. Two times ago, I got to speak of uh, the subject of when Mary and Martha, remember that? And <clears throat> Mary chose the better part. She was worshiping at the feet of Jesus. What a wonderful subject. And then the last time I spoke was the prodigal son, all about repentance, which is my life's message. I love preaching on repentance because there's such life. Uh, the life of God is on the other side of it. <coughs> this time I didn't get off so good. <laughs> Divorce and remarriage. Yikes. <clears throat> so it's fallen on me. If you don't know, understand this, um, we've been going through the life of Christ, working our way through almost two years now, and um, we're still only to Matthew 19. And so it's fallen on me to tackle this thorny subject. Um, let's, just, let's just look at the word here. And Lord, I do pray that you will somehow bring out your feelings and your sense on this subject as we work our way through this, Lord. And help me to properly represent you, in Jesus' name. <coughs> Excuse me. So, Matthew 19, verse 1. When Jesus had finished these words, he departed from Galilee and came into the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to Jesus, testing him and asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? Now, let me just stop there for a minute maybe provide a little context here. First of all, <clears throat> throughout these, <laughs> throughout all these different uh, episodes, incidents, situations that we've been working our way through the life of Christ, um, it just keeps coming up time and time again. The, the uh, Pharisees right there just dogging his steps, challenging him, questioning him, ridiculing him, doing anything they could to bring disrepute upon him. And so this question is not like a sincere question. They have something, um, it's actually a well thought out scheme that they want to destroy him. And we'll get to that here in a few minutes. But let me uh, provide a little of the backdrop of this question. The Pharisees at that time were made up of two branches. Uh, one branch followed the teachings of a, an elder, a, um, what, a rabbi called Shemai. And the, uh, the other, they were more the conservative branch. And then the other was... Um, Hillel, and um, <clears throat> so many Pharisees followed his line of thought, and he was more liberal-minded. And so <clears throat> this, they differed on practically everything that came along. And the issue of divorce really is only touched on a couple of times in the Old Testament, believe it or not. And uh, one of those questions, or one of those um, situations, passages in Deuteronomy 24 where this situation is addressed. And the first verse says, when a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, he should write her a certificate of divorce and put it in her hand and send her out from his house. Okay, so <clears throat> that's what it says. Shammai's crowd believed or focused on the word indecency, meaning adultery, if she's committed adultery. So they, they put it, you know, focused on that. 
that the woman has committed adultery, she should be divorced. Hillel's um, understanding of it, or focus on it, was when it says here, she finds no favor in his eyes. So it's a much more liberal, broad-minded perspective on what, um, what gave them the right to divorce their wife. And by the way, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but Jesus and the Old Testament and so on, you never hear anything about the wife divorcing the husband. And there's a reason for that, because the whole backdrop of the culture of that time, and really across the entire, um, yeah, at least the Near East, probably the entire world, was that women were looked at as a possession of the man. Kind of like the guy's prize bull, you know, except maybe a half a step up from that. But really not much more than that. It wasn't like American culture is today, you know? And this is what we constantly do is we put our 21st century American culture into the Word of God, and that always tends to lead us astray. It tends to Americanize something that was written by Jewish men 2,000 years ago and, and beyond. So anyway, <clears throat> um, back in those days, women were looked at as second-class citizens. They really had no rights. And um, if a woman was divorced, she was put out of the house, literally put out of the house. She had to walk away from her children, walk away from everything. And she had nothing, she could, there was nothing she could do about it. And so Hillel's teaching, which most of the Jewish men of the time ascribed to, um, she could be put out for anything. She burnt the eggs. You're out of here. You know, that kind of thing. And, or more likely is the guy spotted some prettier girl or something, and he just, you know, I, I want that girl. And, and she would just be put out of the house. It was just a cruel system. So in Deuteronomy 24, what God was doing was trying to protect the woman because the certificate of divorce protected her. Instead of just putting her out of the house, um, I, don't, you know, I can't get into all the details. But this is the thing that bothers me about this is it's so technical when you get into really studying it out. And I'm trying to not get too technical. But anyway, just trust me on this, that God's concern for the wife or, was to protect her and to protect her rights. So what the Pharisees were doing here, were laying, they were laying a trap for Jesus. Um, if he took the side of Hillel, I mean took the side of Shammai, then um, he would be being pitted against the popular teaching of the day. It would be kind of like us today where the grace teaching, grace covers everything. It doesn't really matter what you do. You know, and so to stand against that in this day and age in our church culture is kind of difficult. And it's kind of like that back then. And so the Pharisees were um, kind of setting him against the Jewish men of the day. But their treachery went further than that because this country that they entered into beyond the Jordan was called Perea. And Perea was where... Um, um, Herod Antipas lived. Herod Antipas, if you remember, is the one who had John the Baptist beheaded. Why? Because John the Baptist was publicly calling him out for um, stealing his brother's wife and, and having her divorce her, her, his brother so he could marry her. And John the Baptist was <laughs> fearlessly calling him out and he had his, you know, he, he was beheaded because of it. So this was a cunning ploy, well thought out strategy on the part of the disciples. This wasn't just some off the cuff question. They were looking to do Jesus in. He, at the very least, ruin his reputation, perhaps even more than that, have him killed by Herod Antipas. 
All right, so that's a little of the backdrop. Let's continue reading here. Verse 4, and he answered and said, have you not read? And that's a question he asked the Jews a lot. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, excuse me, and the two shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. They said to him, why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it has not been this way. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for immorality, and marries another woman, commits adultery. Okay, that's what Jesus said. Now, my experience in the church has been that there's two extremes. Um, I could almost say, I was, I'm going to say in this um, understanding of, of this situation, and it's kind of true across the board that there's two extremes, and we want to find middle ground. I can just tell you that. On the extreme, I'll say the left, um, would be Christians, let's call them cultural Christians. Cultural meaning heavily influenced by the world. And so the pounding message and the pounding um, uh, what value system of the world is what's ringing in their ears all the time. Why? Because they go to church on Sunday for a couple hours, but the rest of the week is they are just filling themselves with the message of the world. Television, internet, social media, just constant messaging like that, and it has it has really corrupted their understanding of the Word of God and so on. And so that would be one side, and what they have been taught is that their feelings and their desires dictate every decision in life, and even to the exclusion of the Word of God, because, you know, the Word is kind of tiny in their mind because they're not in it. They're not uh, uh, feeding on it. They're just kind of like, you know, a little bit here and there and Sunday morning, of course. But really, they're filling their minds with the world. So that's on one extreme. On the other extreme would be a hard line perspective from religious minded people who at times can become very narrow minded and rigid in their understanding of what the scriptures saying. I don't know how else to put it other than that. And so for people on that side or to that extreme is what I'm talking about. To that extreme, they would see a black and white statement here. Jesus said, if you divorce or divorced, you cannot remarry. And so, you know, really, I could just... Um, Sit down and call it a day. Because that's what Jesus said, right? Are you guys with me? <laughs> Am I just up here talking to myself? <laughs> Some, you ever wonder about that? <laughs> totally, he gets it. It's like they're just daydreaming. When's this guy going to be done? <laughs> I got things to say, and you better listen to me. <laughs> Okay, what Jesus said seems to be a black and white statement. But I'm, I'm hoping to bring a little color to it and take some of the starkness out of it, okay? Because I don't believe it's as stark as it's presented by those way over there. I don't think it's quite that black and white. I think that... Um, let me put it this way. In Kathy's book... I can't remember exactly how you said it, but basically the way she had to write the book was there's so many different variations of situations that, that um, we deal with with wives married to you guys, you know, and there's all kinds of different settings and circumstances and stuff. Every situation 
is unique and different. And I think that if Jesus were in our midst like Moses, you know, in his day when he would sit and, and consider different things and uh, render judgments and, and so on with um, situations that came up, I think that Jesus would be looking at each situation uniquely. But he was painted into a corner on, by this um, Pharisee. He didn't get up that morning and say, oh, I think I'll talk on divorce and remarriage today. No, he was asked a question, put on the spot, and he gave an answer. And it's not that his answer was wrong. It's just that I'm, all I'm say, suggesting, I think this is true, is that if the Lord were sitting there in our situation today, it wouldn't be just a black and white statement. I don't think his response would be that simplistic. Now, for the sake of our situation here, I'm going to limit it to what we mostly encounter here at Pure Life Ministries, which is that you guys have committed some kind of sin and your wife has filed for divorce. Okay, so I'm going to go by that to just kind of work my way through this, all right? Yep. Thank you. <laughs> He's an intern. He's been trained well. <laughs> Thank you. I'm <laughs> glad someone's listening. All right, so I'm going to just uh, touch on a few things that, I, that help me to just paint some color in this, all right? You guys care? Yes. All right, you're listening, right? Yes. All right. The first thing is any time you, you uh, come across... A situation, especially if there's some kind of controversy in the church, you've got to apply hermeneutical, hermeneutical laws to the situation. Golly, that was difficult. Whenever an honest scholar looks at a passage of Scripture, he has at least two questions. We don't have time to get into all of it. But I'm just going to limit it to two questions, all right? He's going to ask, these, ask himself these two questions. These are in, very important in understanding what the Scripture is actually saying. The first question is, what did the author intend to communicate? And one of the... Um, Issues with that would be, is this intended to be a situational text or a normative text? All right. Normative, situational. What in the world is Pastor Steve talking about? Um, normative would mean a passage of Scripture that all believers in all cultures, in all situations, this text is going to apply to every believer anytime, anywhere. Okay? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. That, I don't care if you're on the planet Pluto. That applies to you if you're a believer. Got that, Carla? Okay. Don't be sleeping on me back there. A situational text is something that was meant for the people, his audience at that particular time and situation. So let me give you an extreme example of this. Paul writes to Timothy, um, come before winter and bring my cloak. <laughs> I don't think the Lord expects us to go looking for Paul's cloak, right? <laughs> That's probably not what he's talking about. Or how about this, a little closer to our situation. This comes out of 1 Corinthians 11. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. And every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. Um, if this is normative, I'm in trouble. Because for the last 40 years, every morning, I go on a prayer walk in the woods with a hat on. And, you know, throughout the day, I'll be out working on my property and stuff. And, 
and I'll be doing something. I always have a hat on when I'm out there working. And so, you know, I'm regularly kind of off and on just talking to the Lord. I just do that. I just like to talk to him. I need to talk to him. Now, can you imagine if I had to sh take my hat off every time? Wait a minute, Lord. You know, <laughs> take my... Wow, that would be difficult. That is what I consider situational. Um, women with head coverings. Now, let me just say that I love this tradition. I really do, because to me, it's, it's, that woman is making a statement to the world, I belong to the Lord. You know, and especially in our day and age with all the filthy-minded men out there, I think it's refreshing to see uh, women just have that expression of decency. You know, I'm not something for you to be lusting after and so on. I, I just like that. But women, such as my wife, who don't wear a head covering, like in church and stuff, I don't think she's in sin because I think it was part of the culture of the time. It was part of the understanding of the time. And I, I just tend to think it was a situational text. All right, are you understanding where I'm... Okay, good. Now, regarding divorce and remarriage... Normative or situational? Well, I'm going to say that I tend to think it's situational, what Jesus is referring to here. And there's many reasons I just don't have time. Really, if I would have had two hours, um, I probably could have covered everything, but I just, yeah, we can't do that. I'm going to say it's situational, and, so, and that's going to partly be understood a little better with the second question that... A scholar would ask himself is, how would the audience of his day have understood what he was saying? <clears throat> so when Moses spoke, what were the children of Israel like? What was their culture like, you know, out there in the wilderness? What was going on? What was the setting like? And all of that, when Moses spoke, uh, what was he saying to them? You have to have that understanding. It wasn't 21st century America. And we're constantly, and I've been guilty of it too, we are constantly um, trying to force fit something that was of a Middle Eastern culture in primitive times into 21st century American Christianity. It doesn't work like that. We have to fit ourselves into that culture to understand completely what was being expressed. Israel was a, th a theocratic nation with a closed society. That was some pretty big words, huh, Chris? <laughs> He's still mulling that over. Theocratic nation ruled by God with a closed society. The Jews were very, you know, this was the, has been their problem for 2,000 years. Why the world hates them, or one of the reasons the world hates them, is because they're so closed off as a culture, as a people. No matter if they're in France, you know, 1940, or Palestine in, two, in uh, you know, 2,000 years ago. They were a closed society, but we aren't like that. We're not a theocratic nation, that's for sure. And we're not a closed society either. We need to try to get our minds back there. So let's look at the context again of that situation, the culture. The Pharisees had this contempt for women. And if they wanted to just dump a woman... They could do that. And by the, way, um, by the way, the Hebrew word for divorce is actually send out. That's literally what it means, send her out. And that's what they could do and would do if they wanted to. So if that happened in first century um, Judea, what is she going to do? What happens to her? She's been stripped of her reputation She's been stripped of her children. She's been stripped of her home. She's been stripped of her sustenance. You see how cruel and unmerciful this, this way 
um, this chauvinistic culture was like towards women in that time. So what was Jesus thinking when he said these words? And I propose to you that I think he was mainly concerned about the way these women were being treated by these chauvinistic men that just wanted to use them. And if they wanted to dump them, you know, even if they didn't, it was always hanging over their heads. He can dump me anytime he wants. So she's got to walk on eggshells around him her whole life. So how does that work in 21st century America, where 50% of marriages end in divorce? And how does it work in a culture where women are considered equal to men and can go out and earn a living just like a man can? And how does it relate to us in this day when Nearly always, if there's a divorce, the women are the ones who end up with the children. Completely different situation. Completely different um, cultural background. And so I just don't tend to think this, what Jesus is saying, was meant as a normative commandment, meant for all people, all times, every situation, forever and ever. I just don't tend to see it that way. All right, number two. This, I want to um, take a look at this statement Jesus made, what therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. The reference in his statement is to a marriage of two people who have the Holy Spirit indwelling them and the, in a, a marriage ceremony that is done, uh, consummated in the sight of God with the understanding that they both have sought God's will and they're both convinced we are marrying the person that God has ordained for us to be married to. That's what I believe Jesus is referring to when he says God has joined together these two people. This was not referring to, I don't believe, referring to a flimsy, flippant kind of commitment that is so often made in marriages in our day. So, if you have two believers, true believers, let's pick on Austin and Tabitha. Mm -hmm. Tabitha, who's missing quite suspiciously this morning. We're all wondering what's happened to Austin's wife. (laughs) She's a midwife. She's off (laughs) doing what midwives do. (laughs) But anyway, um, Austin, you know, I'm not going to pick on you anymore. Yeah, I can see. I, I need a couple. How about Patrick and Joella back there? Yeah. yeah. Patrick and Joella. If you two start having problems, now, did you, know, you guys didn't notice this, but when I said that, Patrick had his arm around her, and he right away took his arm <laughs> off of her. <laughs> There's already a breach right now. Put your arm back around her. <laughs> okay, we're, this is getting away from me. <laughs> you start, you two start having problems. You need to, this is what I think the Lord would say to you. You need to both humble yourselves, quit just thinking about yourself, and start thinking about the other person. You made this covenant before me, and I expect you to honor it. That's what I think the Lord would say to you, too. So don't get any strange ideas back there. So in other words, a marriage done with two believers in the right spirit has been, is, it's a holy consecration before God. Now back to our situation here. You guys. Now this is interesting that Luke had you raise your hands if you had made a commitment to the Lord. Boy, did you nail yourself. 
Um, that commitment didn't hold out very well, did it? And I question, those of you that are married, I question the level of your sincerity when you said your vows. You know why I question that? Because I know what I was like. And I know that I was exactly what I said earlier. I made my vows. Just get me through this ceremony. We want to be married. You know, just a flippant, complete lack of concern about, is this really God's will? And I suspect maybe your wives, you know, some of you probably have godly wives. And for them, they were really trying to um, honor God with their marriage when they married you. But most of you had sexual sin hidden that you didn't tell her about. So you went into it as a deceiver. I did too. Me too. So I just don't tend to see that as a marriage that God has put together. It doesn't mean that it can't be something, become something beautiful. Ours has. And, you know, once I got her straightened out. <laughs> Payback's coming. I know. No, really, though, um, I would say for the last 38, 40 years, it's been 44 years almost, we've had a wonderful, wonderful marriage that God has blessed and used. So all I'm trying to get at is I'm questioning that the marriage Jesus is referring to fits in with marriages today that aren't entered into with that kind of consecration. That's all I'm saying. And <clears throat> I actually think there's something very big here, and that is the will of God. If marriage isn't entered into with the real belief that this is the will of God, then I'm just going to question that God's in it. So whatever with that. That's just one more thing of what has made me, kind of pushed me over to no, no, a little over this side, um, is that statement. All right, the third thing is you have to take into consideration what is God really like, his character. And this is a big thing to me also. Now, Kathy and I, um, if you don't know this, we were both divorced before, and we got married, and this all happened back in our days of sin, okay? And... Um, a few years ago, a very religious-minded man, way over on that extreme, sent word to me, and he said, tell Steve Gallagher that he needs to put his wife away. And what he meant by that was um, that I was to buy her a house or rent her a house, and she was to live separate from me because, you know, we are transgressing the law, and, um, and she is to live separate. Okay. Now, <laughs> where is the mercy for Kathy in that scenario? She's supposed to be treated like a leper from this community? Really? <clears throat> you can see where people go with this kind of thinking. You know, whatever the case with divorce and, and remarriage, okay, whatever the case is with that, I just want to tell you something I absolutely state with unequivocal... That was a big word, and it just tied me up. What, what else do I say? Confidence. Confidence. <laughs> God is not a harsh, religious, scrupulous rule dispenser. That is not the Lord that I know. He's a God, he's a being of love. God is agape. The scripture tells us that. It doesn't say God is a rule dispenser. 
His laws are built on the law of love. And if you'll take the time to read through the New Testament commandments, you will find that every one of them has to do with loving God and loving others. The Ten Commandments, same thing. The first four, loving God. The last six, loving other people. It's not about keeping minutia rules. It's about interacting with this being in love. And I can just testify for myself that I obey him because I want to please him. Because I love him. Because he's been so good to me. You know, now some people are on the side of just tell me the rules and, and I'll obey the rules. And okay, I'm not saying that's necessarily altogether wrong, but you better have more life in your relationship with God than that. A couple months ago, um, one of my guys here, he's sitting here this morning, um, came to me pretty discouraged. And um, his situation, someone, a, a pastor he had talked to had told him, given him a little phrase that's become a, a little phrase we hear in the church, one wife for life. And um, <clears throat> he was pretty discouraged the day that he came to me, and he was saying that the thought of going, he's, he's about 30 years old, the thought of going the rest of my life with no hope whatsoever of ever being married is just, yeah, I don't have the strong enough word to express what he was, what I saw on his face that day. He told me this. And I said, I know what Jesus said, but my experience with the Lord, that does not describe the God that I know that would lay that on you. That just doesn't. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just saying that from my perspective, my understanding of the Lord, what he's like, how he's treated me, and so on, that is not the way he comes across to me. Now, I'm not advocating some loose approach to Scripture. Absolutely not. And if you've read any of my writings, you know that I'm not like that. I'm not a loosey-goosey with... Am I supposed to say that? <laughs> Moving on. Number four, the fourth thing I just want to touch on. God is a God of restoration. And this was one of the things the Pharisees hated about Jesus because he gladly went to the sinners and gladly tried to win them, just like Luke was expressing, wanting to win them to himself. And by the way, one of the scholars that I was reading on this subject said, um, he said, he's referring to certain traditions and denominations that believe that you can't be in ministry if you are divorced. And he said, God's a divorcee. <laughs> I guess he can't be on their elder board. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. If that, <laughs> I'm not looking to offend anyone. I just thought it was kind of funny. Um, but it's true. God divorced Israel. <clears throat> God loves to restore people. Redemption is the heart of the gospel, guys. It's the heart. That's where you have that's why you have hope. I don't care what you've done. I've said this in I don't know how many prisons I've spoken in. I don't care what you've done. And I know I've spoken to murderers, serial killers, rapists, child molesters, everything you could imagine. I have ministered to them in prisons. And I have told them, I don't care what you have done. 
Our God is a God of restoration. And he's a God of redemption. It doesn't matter how bad you've, you know, whatever it is you have done. There's always redemption at the cross for anybody. You know, it isn't so much sin that's condemned in Scripture. It's a given that humans are going to sin. What was roundly condemned was lack of repentance, a lack of change, a lack of turning to God. That is what God condemns, mostly, more than anything. And you have the picture, um, really a beautiful picture of this Zacchaeus, which I'm going to be preaching on his story in about a month. And I've already come up with the title. I haven't done any studying on it. (laughs) But I got a title. Would you like to hear it? How do I know you really mean it? You've said things in the past you didn't mean, you know? Got a track record there. (laughs) Zacchaeus, the ultimate taker. That sounds good, right? (laughs) We'll see if it turns out. (laughs) What about Moses and David? Both of them murdered men. And Paul, maybe, I mean, he hounded Christians, got through them in prison. Some believed that he actually had Christians killed. You got the three biggest branches of Scripture. These are the men God used to pen those words. All destroyers of life. And am I to believe that being married or, or married after you've been divorced trumps that? That this is the unpardonable sin? I don't think so. If, even if it is sin, I'm not even saying it is. I mean, it could be. You know, I'm just giving you what I... Listen, guys, I am intellectually honest. I don't buy into systems, these doctrinal systems that try to lump everything the way someone thought it up a few hundred years ago or something, and this is the way it is, and they impose that on Scripture, and every Scripture has to fit within. That's what they do. I'm not like that. I'm not a systems guy. So, you know, I try to be intellectually honest when I'm researching situations and, and um, what the Word of God is saying. And so... I could be wrong. I mean, this, when I studied this out, this is where I came to. But I could be wrong because Jesus did say what he said. <clears throat> I will mention this, that um, one of the men I studied in this, as I was researching this, is a scholar. How do I put this? You got commentators. You, okay, you got preachers like me on this level. Then you got commentators that are maybe a level above, right? These are the guys who write those commentaries. This is the guy that the commentators go to, All right? So he's a research scholar. And um, so I've been studying these guys the last few months or weeks or whatever. And this particular guy, he uh, actually wrote a book, not to the general public, Christian public, but to pastors about this subject and where I ended up, and I didn't do it because of him. I'm just saying that as I studied his stuff, okay, well, he's saying basically the same stuff that I'm saying. He ended up in the same place for what that's worth. All right, so I'm going to wrap things up here. And basically, we have two groups of people represented here. Those who are married or hope to be married one day, that's one group. And I want to strongly exhort you guys, how many of you are married and you're not, you know, being divorced? Your wife isn't filing for divorce. Okay, a bunch of you. God bless you guys. Man, after what you've put your wife through, well, you better treat her like gold when you get back home. And, the, and whatever single guys, how many single guys in here? Wow, a bunch of you too. Is there anybody left? 
Am I just preaching this message and nobody's paying attention? <laughs> all right, well, let me talk to you guys. First of all, you're married or you hope to be married. I want to strongly exhort you to reverence your marriage. Yeah. Reverence it. Treat it with the reverence it's due. Recently, we've had a couple of weddings. One of them back there we just referred to. And uh, Gabe and Mercy, I don't know where Gabe and Mercy are at and why they're playing hooky. <laughs> but um, I want to read a couple of passages that, um, let me just get to these. Pastor Nate officiated Patrick and Joella's wedding. And this is what he said. He, he said a really wonderful thing, but this is just kind of a synopsis of it. He said, the significance of marriage is that it is a living illustration of the relationship that God desires to have with his people. Nothing about the marriage relationship is coincidental. Every aspect has been intentionally designed to communicate a message. From the differing roles, the two becoming one, the new life that springs forth from the intimate relationship. Marriage is God's visible sign of an invisible relationship. And because it's God's sign, it's extremely sacred, holy, and anointed by God for a purpose. Yeah, that's, that's very profound. You could sit and chew on that for a long time. And Pastor Ed gave one at Gabe and Mercy's wedding. And referring to this verse that we saw, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. He said, that's the origin and sanctity of marriage, an institution as old as creation and as holy as God himself is holy. Mm -hmm. I have only one charge to give you. Your charge is to preserve the oneness of this marriage, to preserve the physical oneness, the emotional oneness, and most importantly of all, the spiritual oneness of this marriage. And I will tell you this, maintaining spiritual oneness is the key. Mm -hmm. All right, those are very... Profound statements, showing the sanctity, the beauty of what marriage before God should be. So again, if you're married or hope to be married, you need to make sure that you're entering into it or, or whatever, treating it with the utmost reverence. All right, those who are divorced. Is anybody divorced or just my staff? <laughs> I'm not sure what that says about us. All right, so those of you guys who have are divorced or in the process, whatever. I have a question that trumps everything else. What is God's will for your life? That's it right there. That's the most important thing. What is God's will for your life? You guys in the past lived by your feelings and desires, you did what you wanted to do. If you felt like, whatever, you just did what you wanted to do, however you felt at the time. But you've got to learn now to live your life submitted to God's authority at all times. You have to figure it out. And, you know, some things are black and white. They are clear. You know, it's just absolutely clear in Scripture. Other things are, are not so clear. And so those things, you have to find God's will. Like I was talking to Pastor Ed earlier, and, and he said when he counsels guys on this subject, he tells them, go and find out for yourself. Go and seek the Lord about what he believes on this, this subject. But I'll say even beyond that is seek the Lord for his will for your life. And to do that, we've always taught that first thing you have to do is you have to become neutral. You know, if 90% of you wants to be married and you're just driven, 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 I've got to have a wife, I've got to be married. I'm just, you know, you're not going to be able to hear from God. You're not, you know, if you had a, a feeling like, you know, I'm, I met this girl and I feel like it's God's will that I be married. How do you know that? When your voice is booming inside your head, how are you supposed to hear the still small voice of the Holy Spirit? 
You've got to get to the place of being neutral. You know, like, in other words, Lord, you know my heart. I want to be married. But if you feel like I need to be single, then I'm okay with that. I'll, I'll just, I'll be all right. Because I want to be in your will no matter what. Because if I get married and out of your will, it's going to be a disaster. So I want to be in your will. That is the most important thing, even beyond my desire to be married. And then once you've come to that point, you've got to pray about God's will. And when I say pray for his will, I don't mean pray night and day for a wife. That's not... (laughs) How can you be neutral and do that? You just... You know, practically speaking, you just mention it to the Lord occasionally. Lord, I bring it to you again. You know, I just need to know your will on this matter. He'll speak to you guys if you'll learn to listen for his voice. And, you know, get all the clutter out of your head. You're getting the clutter out of your head since you've been here. You don't have the world booming its voice in your head anymore. You you have spiritual voices coming at you all the time. You, are, you should be getting to a place while you're here of being able to hear the voice of the Lord. Getting that sense inside. I know the Lord is speaking to me about such and such. <clears throat> your past history has been to live by your desires. And I know that the Lord has something else for you, and he wants to teach you how to be led by him. Paul said, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. You know what it means to be led by the Lord. You need to come into that where that's a real thing to you, not just some religious reading the Bible and doing what you think it says or something. Learning how to hear from the Lord, honestly, with an honest heart. All right. I want to end with a prayer um, that Paul prayed for the Colossians, and then Pastor Ed's going to come up and, and do something with this mess. This is what Paul prayed, Colossians 1. 9 and 10. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. God bless you. For more content, subscribe to our bi-weekly video podcast, Pure Life Ministries Sermons, on Apple Podcasts or Podbean. Our bi-weekly audio podcast, Purity for Life, explores how real life meets real Christianity by tackling the tough issues for those struggling with sexual sin. You can subscribe wherever you get podcasts. And you can find all our content on our website, purelifeministries.org.